special meeting of the Hadley School Committee. We're here at the elementary school uh, for a special pro uh, proposal on uh, technology. And we're going to start with Mrs. Moyer. All right. So would you get the mic, Jeff? Um, I spoke to those of you on the staff a couple of months ago and indicated to me that it was my intent to bring this forward as a proposal. Sorry, <laughs> technology gone awry. <laughs> I was just thinking that I turned my cell phone off. Um, and I've spoken about it a couple of times at a school committee meeting that we were doing this, that we were meeting, why I thought it was important. So what I've put together is about a 10 minute kind of overview of the proposal. And then what the staff has put together is about a 20 minute presentation of some of the things they could do with it if they had it. Um, and then my assumption, Roby, is that the school committee will make decision on this when you talk about the whole budget because we've talked about putting this out not in the regular budget but as a special article uh, for town meeting consideration if it go if if the school committee does do that um, i'm going to need the school committee is going to need your help in selling it to the town right we all know why it's important but we're going to have to make sure that everybody else knows why it's important and dream up some strategies on how to do that so mike if you would so the first thing I did is try to tie it to the mission statement of the school district. And I'll give you, I'm not going to read this, I'll give you a second. This is the mission statement of the Hadley School District. Okay. It is this part of the mission statement that I think a technology-enriched curriculum speaks to. And as I told you when I met with you as, as a staff, I won't and I don't want to talk about technology as pieces of equipment. I want to talk about it as how it will enrich learning and enrich uh, the curriculum and enrich student knowledge of the global society. But if you look at the next slide, Michael, the ISTE standards, which I gave you all a copy of, I'm going to turn the lights back on for a second. ISTE is the International Society for Technology and Education. And ISTE has standards for teachers, administrators, and students. And I was saying, Jeff, that in other districts that I've been in, I've required administrators to have an industry standard for a goal every year to start bringing the technology expertise up. But if you look at the standards, particularly like at 1A, apply existing knowledge to generate new products and processes. 2D, contribute to project teams to solve problems. 3B, locate, organize, analyze, and evaluate. All of that kind of language goes after the mission statement of students being able to communicate and analyze and meet individual learning styles. And I won't be here when we do this, but my hope is that someday Hadley will incorporate the ISTE standards into the curriculum. Where, where are projects that you can do within the language arts or math or science or social studies curriculum going to reinforce the ISTE standards for students? Um, and I told Jeff the administrators may well have an ISTE standard goal next year. <laughs> but you can see they have them in all these areas. The, the student ISTE standards are at the point where they will be, they were developed in 2007. They were the first ones developed by the society. They are at the point of meeting, uh, they're under revision this year. So they will probably be even more comprehensive. Okay, with more technology resources, we would reduce inequity of student access. Right now, in my mind, it's, there's really inequity of access for students to technology in which curriculum. Part of it is some of you have the equipment, some of you don't have the equipment, some of you are tech, more technology literate than others, and it comes down to kind of luck of the draw with what class a student is in, whether or not they have the advantage of a technology in which curriculum. That's inequity of student access as far as I'm concerned. You have purchased, we have purchased two series, Reading Street and Envision, that have a whole technology component that we are not able to use in almost everybody's classroom at this point, which would enrich the, enrich the curriculum for the kids, but also give you more feedback on where they are in their learning cycle and what you have to go back and reteach. So this is kind of using our money to its advantage. If we order sets of what I'm calling clickers, and we do have those in the budget, that's an automatic formative assessment. You will know immediately whether or not students understood the concept you're trying to teach, trying to uh, have as your learning objective that day. And if there are five students in class that, that didn't get two-digit mathematics, you know who your learning group is the next day and who you can move on with. So it's immediate feedback for that. The next one, Michael. This piece speaks to the ISTE standards. K 
kids really, even more than us, all right, really need to understand what it is to be a responsible user of the technology, what the etiquette of the internet is, et cetera. And uh, in my mind, this needs to be done at an earlier age because kids are very proficient with the technology. Hi. <coughs> and hopefully integrate the ISTE standards thereby making them better prepared for their future in a technology-based society because they're going to come out of school districts that have technology, strong technology and rich curriculums, pre-K through 12. Right now, Hopkins Academy is in a very fortunate, they don't have everything they need, they don't have everything they want, but they're in a very fortunate position that their trustees have funded them for a number of years. So, and, and because of budgets and all kinds of other things, you have not been funded that much so the kids start out somewhat behind in terms of technology literacy to begin with, just because of the way things worked out here. It might also, I think there's one more. Okay. Yeah. Potentially reduce the number of choice out parents who are looking for a more enriched curr curriculum, a more diversified curriculum, right? Um, and can go on to the next slide. Just some statistics of where we are. You are a school that has a bigger student population than Hopkins. You have way fewer computers. Students, there was one computer for every 3.3 students here. There's one computer for every 1.3 students at the academy. The, the classrooms, they have le fewer, less classrooms, but they have more classrooms that have five or more computers in them than you do. They have almost three times as many interactive boards as you do. Um, and again, more classrooms with projectors, but having no interactive boards. It, it, here, it's every 6.2 students has the advantage of having a classroom with an interactive board where you can do a lot of the enriched technology. There, it's 1.8, which means 32% of your building is covered for the interactive technology, where 88% of their building is covered. Right. The age of your computers, this number is gonna be important. There are 73 computers over here that are six years to nine or ten years older. All right, that's old. Um, these 12 just came uh, through a donation from Bass Mutual. So if we replace some of these computers, it may be that some of the older ones stay because they're reliable and they're suitable for some, but 73 is just way too many aged computers to have to do what you need to do. I talked about this staff when I came, is that if the school committee supports this, you have agreed that you're all gonna to pledge to support it and use it in your classroom. I have said, the administration has said, we will supply sufficient training and support so the technology uses is sustainable. You'll see money in the request for this. In my opinion, it would be wasting money to buy the stuff and not do the training, and do the training long-term, long-haul, work embedded, not just one day at the beginning of the school year, because it's just not gonna get used that way. And one of the things that we need as a district is a three-year technology plan. And I, Jack, it's not gonna be a group that I'm gonna be looking for this summer to work. We've, I found a facilitator to come in and work on a three-year technology plan where we talk about what we wanna do with the technology first, these are the things we want to accomplish instructionally, community-wise, uh, administratively, and then you backfill on what kind of equipment you need. It's not just about buying equipment, it's what do you want to do with it, and what do you want to accomplish. So if anybody's interested, I'm gonna be looking for three to five people paying the contractual price for doing some work this summer with a facilitator. But we need a technology plan, all right. Next one, please. Okay, the costs. And I'm going fast because I want to give John and the staff time. I've kind of um, divided them into these areas. The interactive boards, Michael, are the biggest expense to have every classroom in this building have an interactive board. And this is a very low price, all right, that the vendor was willing to give us because of buying so many. This is the bulk of the money, the $78,000. Active vote response units are yes or no. They're primarily more for younger students. Active expression are yes or no, but they're long answer. You can put in open-ended questions and longer answer. They're primarily as you start getting up into like third, fourth, fifth grade, all right? 
the shipping, and then there is training that goes with getting Promethean boards from the company. There's first kind of just basic training on how does this thing work, how do I turn it on and off. Um, there's simple uses and then advanced uses. And they would come and do that training periodically during the school year, right? My hope is that if this passed, if this school, well, first of all, I guess I'm already assuming the school committee is going to put it out as an article. I know I can't do that. <laughs> but if it put, got put out, if it passed, that we'd order this stuff this summer, it would be installed, ready to go in the fall. And one of those first days before school starts, we do some professional development training and then schedule it during the year. So that's access points. You need to have a wireless network, all right? Your building is not wireless at all. And that's one of the things that I didn't put up there about Hopkins. They are now totally wireless. So they need access points, network switches, wiring for access points, and eight licenses. Oh, computer upgrades. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is 27 computers for some of those 73 that need to be replaced at approximately $500 each. This would be upgrades for both staff and students, but the next one is more the student uses. We've talked about labs versus cows. I'm not sure if everybody on the school committee knows a cow is the computer on wheel carts, that rather than have a, a labs, many schools are going to computers on wheels because it stands a better chance of being integrated into the classroom if you can roll them into the classroom and every student gets one and you can use it on the projects that you're working on it really it stands a better chance of having it be like integrated than be a special that you, you know like going out for music or pe and it really is in class 50 laptops okay so we budgeted for two cars you will be acquiring a third car we got a double order for a cow that was ordered at the high school that has 28 computers in it, right? So they got their original order. The second order is coming here, right? They are Chromebooks, which means you have to have internet access to use Chromebooks, or not internet, um, wireless, wireless access. Wireless. You need the wireless access anyway. But what this means is each hallway would have one, right? And <coughs> approximately 20 old and failing computers will be eliminated and the others would be redistributed. The plan would be to keep one lab in the room that was made for the lab as opposed to the library and then have rolling carts in each hallway and a couple more computers in each classroom through the redistribution of these. But you all know, particularly the ones in the library have a high failure rate at this point. And there's, it's very, I, I don't even know if it's happened this year that every single one of them has been working in there at the same time on the same day. Um, Ongoing work embedded professional development, $10,000, which would be in addition to the training on the interactive boards that was shown earlier. So it comes to, Michael has this down to pennies and cents, <laughs> um, 148,551 and 34,000. I would ask the school committee to put it out there for 150,000, just to have a round number, kind of just in case. And I think that's an understatement that I don't think all the staff or a lot of the staff would be here today if they weren't hopeful of you supporting this. I clearly would am hopeful of it because I've made a big deal out of it. Um, and I think it's probably the first thing I've made a big deal out of in having. I just think the inequity of student access between the two schools and inside the school is a huge issue. And preparing kids for a technology-based society, our kids are already starting out behind. And Hadley isn't known for being behind. So we need to get up to snuff on the technology piece as well. Anybody have any questions? I'm sorry, I'm late. It's okay. I'm glad you got here safely because I know I you drove really, really fast. I know um, <laughs> you had to from where you were coming yes. from. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I'm late, but but it looks like this is individual PCs rather than the consideration of a server and a networked system. Is that right? And did you consider a server, like a single server, so that everyone? Citrix system? OK, kind of, yep. Uh, yes, or, well, have we considered it? No, not really. But, uh, I, but we I do have be. a network that looks <clears throat> anyway that, up, that things like admin plus are on and so forth, and a master but, server for the school district. But we have a very good network in place, so yeah, it, it, that could be done, but where we are right now, I'm not sure you're going to have that great of savings. Well, 
we just did it in our organization and spent a lot on a server and then instead of buying PCs bought thin clients yeah. for most of our staff and a thin client is two hundred dollars so by doing that we now have everyone on the same software everyone on the same file sharing system and you can upgrade or add new for only two hundred dollars so for us it was good but i don't know if it would be here and that's something if the school committee wants us to we can look into it in terms of the efficiencies of it i don't i don't think it would detract anything from the benefits in terms of <laughs> curriculum access and enrichment but it would be the efficiency of cost and the efficiency of setup the idea of having everybody on the same software on the same reporting systems is uh, is very appealing. Um, so to get at that point, though, um, you're still going to need new computers to be able to operate those thin clients on them, right? So you you wouldn't be able to use the five or seven year old computers with thin clients. You you'd no. need to upgrade the hardware. And I didn't actually see any line items that addressed the software at all. So regardless of whether it's thin client or each. Uh, you know, you get a site-wide license for uh, Google. Um, you know, Google's, which we already have. I think we have a. Apps. We already have a Google app. Yeah. You know, a business or whatever. Education license, an education license. Um, so I, I can't imagine that we would get like 250 like Microsoft Office. You know, right. things like that or anything like that. So I imagine that they would all be server server based and networked. So. I imagine, regardless, I think the hardware costs remain the same. Yeah, it, it may switch around in terms of software. Software, but right. And most of the uh, administrative software already is network based, right. like Google Docs and things like right. that. So I mean, there's, and we can bring this up again when we talk at school committee on the 28th. Mm -hmm. But to me, the bottom line is we need to do something, right. and something rather major at the elementary school. Mm -hmm. How we configure it is the question. Perhaps, but not. I'm hoping it's not if we should do it, uh, with how we can figure it. Anybody on the staff have any questions? I'm sure you raise your hand. But it just <laughs> okay. So John, you've got about 20 minutes, and then we'll go I'm assuming you have people know John. I have heard Jeff wanted to introduce something. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just wanted to do a quick introduction. John Pesterello is our fourth grade teacher. One of them here. Um, he does not have a Promethean board. He has one of our. Uh, antiquated smart boards um, but uses a lot of technology uh, we're in Barb White's classroom and uh, Josh Driver's classroom next door they are the two classrooms that have current Promethean boards so John I asked if he would be willing to do this uh, presentation for you and show you about 20 minutes worth of what we can use if we have this technology the variations of it and um, I know I appreciate um, you doing this John and also contributions that uh, Barb and Josh have also made for this so it's all yours okay uh, so because I use a smart board instead of Promethean some of this is a little different I started to use the Promethean in order to understand some of its workings um, I may have to use a mouse a little more than I'm used to but I have a general outline of some of the areas that it will cover. Basically, um, everything here is interrelated to everything throughout. Um, I want to talk about what things we are currently doing as teachers who have access to a smart board of Promethean with the uh, curriculum that we have, the Envision uh, Math and also the Reading Street. I want to talk about um, some of the advantages of having cows or the computer on wheels in our school. Um, and then basically the technology um, with the Reading Street and the Envision Math um, and just having more computers in the classroom, how that would affect um, our ability to grade or get instant access to student results, um, how that might affect um, how we interact with parents at home and how students are able to extend their learning at home. Um, and then also kind of some of the new technology which I just started to play with. I know we talked about the active expressions. Uh, my classroom has started using these a little bit. We borrowed them from the high school. Uh, so we have a little bit of knowledge of what that would look like. And then kind of future implications of um, what we would be able to do um, beyond what any teacher in the school has done to this point. Um, basically, I'm going to open a whole bunch of windows. I have links to most of them, but I also opened many of them already. Um, this is the teacher access to the uh, Reading Street and Math series. Uh, these are what I have available to me um, from the two programs. Basically, it has 
I'm going to be using the mouse exclusively, maybe. Um, it has access to our math series um, videos that introduce a topic, videos that can be used as lessons. Teachers can do this with or without an interactive board uh, because it just needs to be projected. But it just presents the information in a new way to students. So instead of you know, passing out manipulatives or teaching something on the board, um, students who need you know, more of a visual cue and a song to go along with it um, can get um, that from this series. There are CDs where anybody with a projector can do this. You don't even need internet, internet access. Um, but I know that when I bring my students to the computer lab, uh, and if they have a free time, they're able to pull different activities from our class folder, and they have, you know, like math practice or um, type to learn or all these other programs. And I started to see um, the last couple of weeks that students come back to one of these videos, which is just. Um, an introduction about how to multiply uh, strategies are uh, for multiplying by 10 and 11 because it just it's interactive it's fun it's something that the kids find Whoa, engaging math master slow down you're breathing pretty hard there you know a typical math master like yourself breathes about 50 gallons of air per hour and you've been at this for about three hours and this is so something that can be assigned to students those three hours. Um, after the lesson they can go back to it if they miss the day the math whole day can be assigned to them brain, not you need to know how to multiply by tens. So I'm going to slide over here. We have a, a dancing Elvis. Is anything like this? I mean, it, the kids love it. So I'm not going to get into it too much, but it's full of information like this. Um, the basic lessons are, let's see pull up one of these. They have the lessons. Um, it's really good for students because in the middle of the lesson they're able to access some of the vocabulary that they don't know. Um, you can assign this to them in the computer lab on their own. I know that sometimes I have students who would use this um, in order to support the information. If they're struggling with it, as I'm working with other students on a problem set, you know, I'll put them back in the computer and like, let's watch it again. Let's take the quiz again. Um, so it always introduces you know, the vocabulary that you need to know at this point. You know, if you can't even read the word, you're worried about that. You're able to have it read to you. Um, you can do it at your own pace. You can pull up a glossary right away for the students to use. If you need to look up the word multiplication, you'll be able to do so. Looks like it's not popping up here. Um, and then you can get into your lesson. How can you use rounding to estimate when you multiply? Think about this question during the lesson. Okay, and then as we are teachers and we're presenting what you know our goal for the lesson is, the, the lessons are laid out that same way. It's in student-friendly uh, language, so they can come back to it again. And then it runs through a regular is lesson. Holding a readathon, any student who raises more than five hundred dollars earns a prize. And again, I'm not going to belabor the point, but it's you know an entire lesson. Hector has pledges totaling four dollars per page read. Alan has pledges totaling $3 per page read. So some of the teachers who have access to technology were presenting this on the board um, to supplement our other lessons on the interactive boards. Uh, we're also assigning this to students to complete on their own. It has access to the pages. Nope. It has access to the pages. It is really an act interactive. Yeah, it is. <laughs> the light's not flashing, right? Um, it has access to the pages or questions from the book um, that they can do on their own. They can also uh, work on a workspace, which it looks, oh no, here's one of them popping up, where they can actually write their own answers and you can even print from these so you can kind of see where each student is on individual questions. I know that I oftentimes use this. Um, all of this information is presented in different ways in the books. I can print out a page that has a quiz that's either the same as this or similar to this, but the kids, you know, who have access to this are able to look at the questions and take their time in a more meaningful way um, and then get immediate feedback. I'm not going to answer these meaningfully, but if you have a five question problem set, instead of having a teacher go around and answer, you know, go through with a checklist, the kid can say, oh, I'm ready to have it graded. And if you're getting a low number of questions like I just did, correct, then there's a page from your math workbook which we can print out and we do print out. Um, sometimes we send these home as homework because it has the, the lesson on top to support students and parents. But they can have that at their level available to them. Um, at the same time, if they did really well, they get the, the questions that extend the lesson. And then the vast majority of students, you know, we're getting a three or four, making a mistake or two um, on the quiz, we're getting the, the basic lesson. Okay, you get the gist of the lesson, you just need more practice. Um, 
Those are some of the biggest uses of Envision Math. John, I might add yep. also on, on the Math Envision, um, we have all have that CD. Mm -hmm. and I generally uh, teach each lesson with the interactive. And when you touch on the picture, it says the word. So you are um, you're meeting the needs of your uh, ELL learners. You are they're seeing it, they're hearing it, and I mean I don't know how you set that up, but you can actually just touch on it so that you can progress each day um, through that lesson as quickly as you want or as slowly as you want. Um, and you can go back to different parts and you can uh, interact and discuss throughout the lesson. Um, and then as soon as that's on, it, I can't even tell you the engagement I get. Everybody's turned around and they are focused right on the board. Well, I mean, we also, I don't have an example from the website. It looks like it's working. But um, if you have something like place value blocks, um, you're able to actually interact with the toolkit. And if you have a hundreds block, a tens rod, and a ones cube, um, you're able to interact with it in a way that if you're subtracting across zeros, you can actually break apart with a hammer and smash the hundreds block into tens uh, rods in a way that makes it so that students can see that a little bit better than you know taking out the place value blocks in person and just trading them um, using those place value blocks. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about Reading Street. I think we as a class or as a, a team use this a little bit more the interactive path um, because there is much more to offer than the math. The math has many um, good qualities but using the manipulatives and getting the practice is really the the most important part with the math. Um, again this is going to present information to students um, in multiple you know ways if you're a kinesthetic, a kinesthetic learner there's things for you. If you're an audio learner it's great for you um, and if you're a visual learner it's there for you too. Um, there are concept videos that we use that have our vocabulary. All the teachers already have access to this vocabulary. And we can, you know, start a conversation with our students. But they have videos that use some of the vocabulary words here or other words that might make you think about a, hu uh, a big question for the week in a more meaningful way. Here's one of the big questions. What patterns in nature guide the lives of animals? I think that's one that Barb actually has yeah, so posted on the back here. Only yeah. A couple minutes, so you really have time for it. And then the, they're able to answer again. <laughs> I, I'm I'm so used to just touching the board and not even having my mouse near me. So. I don't use the mouse. What patterns in nature guide the lives of animals? In the fall, lots of birds head south toward warmer weather. Birds are among the many animals on our planet that go on an annual migration. From so it has the vocabulary the right there for them. Each year, flocks of birds, such as swans, migrate south in search of warmer weather, where they can continue to find food, water, and... You know, it continues with it. It wraps up with the question again for the what students. What patterns in nature do you think guide the lives of the animals? Um, I've used in the lab once where the students are able to write a response. If we had computers on wheels, they're able to type in a response. They can print it right out. Um, if I were to access the teacher uh, site and the grading, you could actually see all the responses. Who's answered in two seconds? Who's, who's taken ten minutes to answer the question? And given a more thoughtful answer, the students can take it right with them. Um, and there's information available for all, for all days here. There's vocabulary activities and games. Um, there's more videos. Uh, one of the big things, just like our Dancing Elvis, we have a uh, what's called a Grammar Jammer. Is that not on this one? Well, this is the vocabulary. There's quiz shows so that they can work with the, um, the vocabulary more. There's matching. I mean, there's just tons of, of different ways to present the information that we can start to build with so, this, but it's already part of the, of the package that we purchased. Yeah. So in order to access it, we need to have uh, projectors in all of class. We need to have projectors in classrooms for students. Your job here. And sometimes I'll put this on the smart board as other students are working on an activity for vocabulary at their desk. And then you know I call up a group at a time. You like we're gonna each answer a question, work together, try to get the correct answer. The blank. The biologist is studying. Um, they can get immediate feedback. This can happen with the story sort cards, which Barb has at the back as well. 
Um, if you're home, you can get access. So here's the Grammar Jammer. Um, again, just you know, an interactive video for students to get excited about um, some things that are a little bit more difficult, so topics that are a little bit more difficult for them, um, such as grammar, but making it fun so that they really want to stick with it. There are four kinds of sentences you really, really need to know. Need to know. These four kinds of sentences will put your skills on show. Declarative. Interrogative. Imperative. And if I can find, yeah. I mean, we have uh, students who, if we ask them what, you know, a declarative or interrogative question, they start to actually use these exact um, questions, like here's one of them, that will actually have the students repeat in the classroom. We say, oh, give us an example of an exclamatory sentence. Exclamatory sentences like to scream and yell. They show strong feelings like, I can't stand that smell. Be you. Exclamatory sentence. So students were literally, if you say, oh, can you give me an example of an exclamatory sentence, they're, oh, I can't stand that smell. So uh, my shoe is over there. I mean, they stick with you. Um, as I started to say, if you're away from school, you can assign um, the textbook. The students have the main selection right there. It'll pop up your actual textbook. Um, you can review the story at home. You can make up a day that you've missed. Um, it's easy to assign students um, information or, you know, here's, here's what we did on Monday. Can you please catch up on, on pages 248? Oh, it's also displayed otherwise. Uh, 352 to 353. Um, looking closely at your vocabulary. This is also easy to manipulate. Um, when you use the teacher edition as well, there's markers where you can start to highlight on here um, so that students can see you interacting with the text um, and asking the higher level questions when it's easier when you, you have that information displayed instead of holding up your teacher copy um, for students to use or to, to learn from. Barb, do you have anything else to add about? I think the big thing yeah. with the interactive board that I've seen with math and language arts is I am seeing a higher level of thinking with the students. Um, and I really believe that it's from watching the videos and actually looking um, at the vocabulary words. They are using some of those vocabulary words in their writing now. So the quality of their writing is improving because they actually know what massive means because they've seen it on the video when they see this big huge redwood tree. Um, so it's, it's coming together for a larger number of students with this higher level of thinking. And you know the research of everything that we're learning is that if they see it, they hear it, and they do it, they will learn it, and, and they will forget it the next year. Um, so I think it's, it's a higher level for them now. Can I ask a question? Just, uh, mm -hmm. Along those lines, I, I think I heard you say something before. I mean, it sounds like from a, um, I guess, classroom management standpoint, if I can put it that way, are you finding that the kids are more focused and attentive with this sort of kind of multiple yeah, it's media quicker. approach? It's quicker. When I would draw an example with the whiteboard and mm -hmm. I would try to fill in the hundreds uh, column, and, and it would take me a while to fill in all those little squares, different colors, to show 300 and then... Uh, 42, and I would lose some kids, I'm sure. So now it's it's much quicker, um, and, and it makes a sound when it puts it up there mm -hmm. as well. So even if they are drifting off a little bit, they're back when they hear that whoop or whatever. So. Yeah, and I've been guilty of, uh, you know, I went to a Red Sox game in the middle of, of a week once, and I, I was at school, went to a Red Sox game, came back, and I slipped a picture into my math lesson about the Red Sox. And, you know, just having it there for a second, the kids, you know, you know the entire class is listening because they'll go, whoa, and I'm like, oh, I'm just kidding. You know, like we're still in the lesson, but, you know, you get the kids back with the sounds and everything, as Barb is saying. Um, I mean, we have cards for vocabulary. We have cards for the story events in order. But, again, you know, a teacher can't make the same sound of getting the story in the right or incorrect order as you can with uh, the smart board as a group or individually. Um, there's a lot of other uh, benefits of this. I'm still bouncing around, I guess, on this outline a bit. But um, this isn't the best example, but you can 
easily um, assign different variations of the same um, lessons to students at an advanced level um, where they get additional supports below level, on level. Um, you can track the information of how they're doing on uh, quizzes and benchmark tests that are presented through the uh, online system. Um, there's extra help for ELL students. Um, and then there's, you know, it, it's just an easy way to differenti differentiate your instruction. Um, teachers would need a bit of support with organizing the information. Um, there are lesson plans available right to them. Um, if you create a class, um, you can actually monitor your assignments and you can see um, you know, who is completing the assignment, as I said before, how long it's taking them. Uh, but you can also get immediate feedback. Um, which is important for knowing you know, who needs support now instead of waiting until the end of the day where you have time to finish grading um, a benchmark quiz or something. Um, you can get that feedback to help your students. John, could you maybe jump to some of the, you had a section down there yep. of things that you do <coughs> that, you have, that no one that yep. haven't done yet? Um, let me talk a little bit about the clickers. Um, I mean, it, we've touched a little bit about the home opportunities. Parents can access all the same information that we have here. We already have um, some of the math um, available to parents. That's if you see my Hadley parents login is here. They can actually get access to the books from uh, first grade to sixth grade. Um, so there's lots of opportunities there. But there's also a lot of things that we can't do. Um, my class has started to use active expression clickers. I'll actually pass one of these out to the committee here. Um, in order to, um, give me even more immediate feedback. Oh, I haven't taught you how to use these. I'm sorry. If you turn on, uh, just hold on the power button here. The universal symbol for power. Um, if I pop up, uh, keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine, be careful, because it's harder without having the markers to do so, um, which the smart board does. If this is A, this is B, and this is C, I can immediately pop up a poll um, for my students and say which one of these represents the uh, the tens rod, and then I can go right here. I can pop up a question immediately. You should be able to type. Oh, that's not going to work the best. Um, you should be able to type in an A, B, or C. You'd have to push the button. Once for A, twice for B, I believe. Oh, just like old <laughs> or thrice for uh, C. And we can actually see who's answering what. Oh, right now, no one has I, answered anything. I, um, I can also pre-create questions. Oh, so let's go to one of those. Um, instead of using a mad minute to practice our math facts, one of the things that I've done with some of our students, let's close this, um, is I've created a problem set. And you can have anonymous answering, so we don't know who's answering what. But you have a, a question displayed on your smart clicker, like mine says 4 times 5. If I type in the correct answer of 20 and hit send, I don't know which number I am here, because it's concealed. I'm a moron. I got one correct. I can't quite see which one is correct. Um, it will put the response up here that you're correct. I can get immediate feedback as a student if I mark something incorrect. Um, it will tell me incorrect and put the correct answer. And then I can close the quiz at my own time, or I can give it a set time to finish. Do you want to save? Sure. Um, and I can display results. Oh, I didn't do something right. I don't know. I haven't used uh, Promethean too much. But I'm able to display the results, just like we saw with the original question of who answered you, which question. Do you know what clicker I'm holding? So if I did Yes, not I do. Um, and actually, I've used it in a couple um, settings. Um, I use it for the geography oh, B, but I see. I'm Nora. So I can have different student IDs and such. Um, and this is an example of my class who took it over two days. Um, the clicker mad minute and who's answering which questions. It's actually randomized, so you can't even get help from your neighbor. But they're broken down into problem sets, easier questions for one through ten, and more difficult questions for eleven through twenty, um, and so on. So I can see who's answering what. A lot of times when students are getting something wrong, they're accidentally hitting too quickly, um, hitting, hitting an answer before they've written it in. You know, I can get immediate feedback of who's doing really well, um, who's struggling. Um, if you have a student who's missed a day, you know, it leaves a spot. But then if they come back and take it the next day, then I have that information for me um, when they return. So you can get immediate feedback. I mean, you can put quizzes on here. Um, I have too much to say, I guess. but. Um, you know, I started to make uh, a review game for 
MCAS, which I know that is not the most entertaining time for students, but if you add sound to Jeopardy and put the questions that way and give everybody a clicker, and you don't have to worry about who's answering what because they can all put their own answer for multiple choice questions or even open response questions, then they're really um, engaged in it. So what I mean, percentage of the day are you what percentage of the day am I using the, uh, the smart board? Um, I'd say at least 50% of the day. Um, but I mean, it kind of depends on the day and the lessons. Um, I use it almost exclusively for math, I, I, meaning that whenever I'm teaching a math lesson, I, I'm almost always on the smart board. Um, even review days where I might have someone working on something different. John, may I interrupt for a second? No worries. Um, one of the things, I mean, right now, and I really commend the staff for being um, wanting to be able to use the programs that we've purchased to their fullest, but as we move forward, there are things that we could do that we haven't even envisioned yet, right? There are software programs out there that instead of John creating a quiz, they'll have a quiz created, and if you start getting the problems right, they branch you off into more difficult problems, mm -hmm. and if you start getting them wrong, they branch you off into reteaching, and so they become even more differentiated in their instructions. And those are places that over time we need to go. Well, I think that the community um, board comes with Active Inspire. Um, John is single, so he has a lot more time to make these. <laughs> I actually don't make a lot of them. I, I take the best components from other work. There are, just on Caribbean Planet, there's yeah. a lot of resources. Like once we have the board, then um, I know Josh and I create accounts. And there are PowerPoints, so I'm not creating everything. Right. It's there and it's readily available. Um, and it is a lot easier, but they even have everything to make the Jeopardy, and it's uh, a lot easier for me to just use the resources. And you know, as a society, we're getting smarter in how to teach our children. We're utilizing the best practices across the nation, not just at Pearson, but yes. academic institutions all over. And so this is the way. This is these are the tools that our students, that our kids use at home. We, to, you know, Xbox, to, um, you know, Pearson's own Papa Tropica software on the on their home computers. It's, it's what resonates with them and it's... And then I can say to them, go home and I know I have your software. Mm -hmm. I mean, put it on the board and then I say, try this at home. Um, because there's more out there than just even using for me. Use the internet a lot. If someone's doing an oral presentation, I can just pull it up. You know, mm -hmm. I'll be done. The, the other piece, and again, I'm, though I'm uh, repeating myself, there are two Promethean boards in the school. And that's a whole lot of kids and a whole lot of teachers that mm -hmm. don't have access to that kind of interactive learning. But what about other subjects? I mean, are we going to need to be prepared to spend a lot on software for history? And I think I think over time you're going to have yeah. to, have to do a continuing investment. Yeah. I mean, if you I didn't put the budgetary numbers up there for the last three or four years. Yeah. Essentially, the the bu budget number for technology has been minuscule. It stayed absolutely level. It's hard you know, you're going to it's an investment. It's not something you can spend 150,000 on and walk. You're probably not going to have to spend 150,000 the following year, but yeah. You're going to have to put money into it annually, like you put into textbooks and supplies. The curriculums that are being produced now, yeah. you can't get one without having yeah. it. They all have the technology yeah. piece in it. That's right. So it's not like you can find something and say, well, we'll get this because it doesn't have it. It's you know, That's the other piece, too. And all of this is, you know, Reading Street, which we've implemented fully this year, uh, and, and, and the uh, Envision, which we are in our third year now using, um, are aligned with the new Common Core curriculums too. That's the other. That's the other aspect of things. They're predicting a day in the not so distant future where textbooks will become a thing of the past, and all of this will be on also testing, correct? Laptops and uh, oh, tablets and uh, other things that make a, a backpack really I mean, light. <laughs> Roby was on the Wonderful. interim principal search committee for Hadley. One of our candidates, Gateway. Actually, the gentleman we hired, they are totally bookless. Totally. It's fantastic. Um, well, it's all on, they have e-books. I'm sorry, it, well, they have e-books right. and, and other technology. And so there are places not all that far away from us that are in a very different spot than we are. And I'm not suggesting having no textbooks. My own personal philosophy is what they call blended learning. Mm -hmm. But you know, there are places that are much further along than we are in the technology field. So John's got a few more minutes. Yep. 
And, and as Barb is saying, uh, we have access to the internet, which just has so many resources um, th through um, Scholastic, anything else that we use. This is an interactive tour that many of the fourth grade teachers used um, about our arrival um, on Ellis Island, where you have, you know, pictures from the archives and actual audio and video um, of interviews of immigrants coming over. It's as simple as if a student has a question, you go to a Google search and you type in a keyword. Oh, what, you know, if I say Rome wasn't built in a day, and the kids are like, what? What are you talking about? And I go, oh, I don't even realize that students know that phrase, you know. So, I, you know, you look up Rome and you, you pull up and here's the Colosseum, here's the Circus Maximus. Please, you know, this was our ancient civiliz civilization that a lot of the architecture you see today, a lot of the laws and government that you see today are based off of. Um, we have access to that with the internet in our classroom. Um, we can't bring our kids down to the computer lab every time we want to talk about something like that. I mean, it's just here immediately for you, vocabulary um, or any kind of concept questions. Um, and as we get into a little bit, let's see. Um, here at Hadley, there are many things that you know, we even haven't started to use. Um, let me zoom in a little bit. Uh, where I worked in Newton years ago, you know, they'll put their morning announcements on the internet. They will blog about books that they've read. They will use cameras to take a picture and put it immediately on here. You have a presentation, you record it, and then you can watch it again and, and then critique what a student is doing well um, or not well. Uh, we can use uh, something called expert or you know even a Jeopardy click or quiz, which is similar to this, but even uh, more fun for younger students where you each have a little buzzer and you push the buzzer when you're ready to answer a question. And the kids don't know it, but it's made so that teachers can call in students randomly or whoever's buzzed in quickest. I mean, they can't tell if, you know, as a first grader or kindergarten, if I push my buzzer in 1.2 seconds and this student pushes it at 1.4, you know, they should be the first person to call, call on. No, you know, you can actually get kids engaged without feeling embarrassed about sharing their answers because they're so um, interested in it. Um, I don't know that anyone here has made a pre-recorded lesson, but we can record our voices and our video, even when a substitute is here, um, and have that as integrated into the math lesson that we're doing. Um, there's so much technology as far as um, in the sciences. Um, when I was in physics in Amherst, um, you know, 15 years ago, we were using computers constantly to monitor uh, forces of friction and, and speed and velocity and, and everything. Um, and we don't have any of that available to us right now. Um, I know with our new copier that we're able to um, scan documents and put them right onto the board. I actually did that um, for the geography bee that we had in the cafe. Um, didn't make a, a, a paper copy with the old projectors, um, or whatever they're, I don't even know what they're called anymore, um, overhead projector because I don't use it anymore because it's obsolete. So. Um, we really just reached the, the tip of the iceberg. There's so many things that are part of our curriculum and there's so many things that the teachers here are doing, whether it's making a quick lesson or taking, in my case, a pen or I guess on the Promethean you just click on the, the marker, but you know, drawing a shape or drawing a phrase that students can interact with. And we're doing that well, but at the same time we are behind and we have a lot more things that we could do um, with the technology. My guess is nobody's experimented with video streaming either. Um, in what regard? As far as watching something in here? Well, as far as... Creating our own video? No, video streaming, downloading to supplement a lesson. Um, we have a little bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, we use the videos that are here. I mean, I, yeah. do you mean something that's happening live? Or, you, or from a distance. I mean, essentially you need bandwidth yeah. to do that. And that's yeah, that's no. We, um, well, I mean, we did a Math and Science Day. Humera, you came in and had uh, actually one of my friends from Boston University. We're, we're more using um, something like YouTube. Last year I had students come in, um, teach a Spanish lesson, and they started to use a video um, to teach us some greetings. Um, so what you're referring to is for the last yeah. two years I've participated, three years, Math and Science Day. Uh, in the last two years we've Skyped in mm -hmm. collegiate inventors and, and um, innovators in real time so that students can learn directly from them and ask questions directly of them on the fly. And that's worked out really well. That does require, well, it requires bandwidth, yes. I bring my own personal wireless connection to make that happen just to yeah. rule out all the technical difficulties that could happen without technology, but um, you, you could do so much to bring the outside yeah. here to Hadley. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. John, thank you. Great job. Thank you. Great job.
have these for the whole year? Um, no, I've had these for three weeks. And, and how long do you get to keep them? Until they're asked for back. <laughs> That's my question to you. Until someone knows they're missing, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. So, does anyone have any questions or any comments they want to make something they really want the school committee to hear? I think you, I, Sarah, and Jane all Several of you actually have made your case very well that this is something we need. How we can figure it, I think, Linda, in terms of uh, servers and so forth, could be up for discussion. But I do think it, it's, it's got to be something in the budget, not a $150,000 item, but it's like, it's like buying textbooks and supplies and materials. It's for instruction. It's not just administrative uses, if you will. Um, it's it's got to be funded at a certain level year after year. And, to get to the point where we are, where 73 of our computers are six years or older, is just kind of tough to dig out of the hole right now. Can I just uh, want to make sure that we're not misspeaking when we're trying to articulate this to the you know, other parties in town that need to, that we'd like to get on board. Uh, Roby and I were at a select board meeting uh, this past Wednesday night, and we did kind of grease the skid, so to speak, to mention <laughs> that you know, this was likely coming in the form of a borrowing article. Um, but we also made it clear uh, that, in our opinion, and I just want to make sure that we're, we're right, that this is not by any means state-of-the-art bleeding-edge technology, that we're just trying to get caught up. Okay, okay so everybody's nodding. I, you know, and I want to make sure that I think it's important for us to send that message as well, um, that the voters understand that, you know, this, this is an absolute necessity. It's not a... Um, pie in the sky, you know, sort of wish for the schools. I mean, I think the biggest example of that is to be able to use the Envision and Reading Street programs that we've got about $100,000 into to their fullest. It's, it's just, it's getting caught up with what we've already purchased. Mm -hmm. It's also and a testament to the teachers here, the excellent job that they've done, because we are a level one school, right. one of the few in the areas, and we don't have an opportunity to utilize all of the resources that we have. So mm -hmm. we're sort of operating, you know, with a limp here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, so it's, a, it's a huge credit to our teachers yeah. for what they've done this year. And I think that, need, that needs to be said loud and clear, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think if we were to ask any taxpayer how many of them have a seven-year-old computer in a remote room down the hall that they could only get access to for a half an hour once a week to answer any burning questions on their minds? Without wireless. Without, without wireless. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you'd find that um, your, your answer right there. But we just, this is a bare minimum. So we have an executive session that we're going to be moving down the hallway. Thank you. Teachers, uh, staff thank for you very coming. much for coming and supporting John yeah. and participating in this. Thank you. Thank you.